Mom, remember when I was eight years old and I told you I was sick so I didn't have to go to school? Mm, which time? So this was the time that I told you I was sick so I didn't have to go to school, but then later on the same day I told you that I was feeling better because I wanted to go to the birthday party? I remember that, and then I took you to the party, and then you told me you were lying again, and you told me that you had homework and had to go home. Exactly. The time I switched my story up three times in the same day. How did that make you feel? Um, pretty unhappy, angry, and kind of pissed off. Exactly. That's how I want you to read the order. The SEC's hypocrisy in arguing to the court, on the one hand, that the speech is not relevant to the market's understanding of how or whether the SEC will regulate cryptocurrency. And on the other hand, that Hinman sought and obtained legal advice from SEC counsel in drafting his speech suggests that the SEC is adopting its litigation positions to further its desired goal and not out of faithful allegiance to the law Hello and welcome back to Legal Briefs. It's been so long I forgot which finger to point with. And thank you mom for chastising the SEC like only a mother could do. Quick family sharing, my mother went back to school in her 40s and obtained her master's degree, which just goes to show you how amazing she is and also that it's never too late for you to change your life. Unless you're over 50, then it's too late. But speaking of late, so much has happened in the Ripple vs. SEC case and in crypto news that I barely know where to start. So I will start at the beginning of where we left off. And in 12 to 15 minutes, maybe more, you will know everything that you need to know. Hang on to your hats. This will go fast. Tesla launch mode activated. <laughs> so let's start at the first major order in the case, which is from about 10 days ago. And this is the Ripple vs. SEC case and it's about the ongoing Hinman email saga. As you know, for over a year and a half now, Ripple has been seeking discovery of the emails related to Hinman's 2018 speech, and they have still not received them. I've never seen a discreet discovery battle go on this long, never. Judge Netburn has ordered them to produce the documents on numerous occasions, and the SEC continues to file objection after objection, and the latest objection was maybe just one objection too far because as we've talked about in like six videos now, the SEC continues to change the story on whether Hinman's speech was his personal opinion, an SEC opinion, or more recently, that it was his division's opinion. And listening to the hearing on the SEC's attorney-client privilege argument, which I did, I got a sense that the judge has just about heard enough. I mean, listen to this from the hearing. The judge, quote, I hate to interrupt you, but you just said something that seems different to me. You said that the speech was given by Director Hinman in his capacity as Director of Corporate Finance. That seems different to me than what you said a year ago. Am I misremembering? Because when we were discussing whether he should be deposed, as I recall, there was argument from the SEC that what he said really had no bearing on this litigation because he wasn't speaking on behalf of that division, that he was really just speaking at a private event. And there was a lot of attention focused on the disclaimers. But you just said just now that he was speaking as director on behalf of that division." Close quote. Now, keep in mind, this judge is extremely polite to the umpteenth percentage. So when she says, I hate to interrupt you, she really doesn't hate it. She has to interrupt you because you are making a mistake. And when she says, am I misremembering, she's really not asking. She knows exactly what you said. What the judge is doing is she is warning you that you are making a mistake and she's giving you an opportunity to fix it. Now, I caught this right away because I'm married and have learned something called warning cues. And it was that frustration and anger from the SEC's lack of logical candor to the court which led to this, the most scathing rebuke of the SEC to date by the court and very uncharacteristic of this judge. Quote, the hypocrisy in arguing to the court, on the one hand, that the speech is not relevant to the market's understanding of how or whether the SEC will regulate cryptocurrency, and on the other hand, that Hinman sought and obtained legal advice from SEC counsel in drafting his speech, suggests that the SEC is adopting its litigation positions to further its desired goal and not out of a faithful allegiance to the law." Close quote. Now, when I first read the order, 
it was like as if I was watching a droopy cartoon and he just turned to the camera and just started yelling obscenities at it. I mean, that wouldn't have surprised me as much as this order did. Kids, Google droopy video clips, you'll understand. And finally, of course, after eight months of dealing with this issue, Judge Netburn concluded that the Hinman emails must be produced. Finally, that's it for her. But of course, that is not really the end of the story because the SEC is now legally entitled to object to that ruling and that objection will be to Judge Torres. The SEC's brief to Judge Torres appealing the ruling on the emails is due on July 26th and then Ripple has up to two weeks to respond. Now, how will Judge Torres rule? Well, keep in mind that Judge Nepper and Torres have worked together in the same building on the same cases for years. And also magistrate judges are basically hired by the circuit judges because they think that they would do a good job. So will Judge Torres call her friend and colleague out for doing a bad job? Yes, the answer is yes, because she is a judge and must adhere to the law. And if Netburn got it wrong, Torres will absolutely call her out on it. But I will go on the record now and say that Judge Torres will not overturn Judge Netburn. Why? Because judges have a lot of latitude in discovery issues and Judge Netburn put together some very well-reasoned and supported orders. I think Judge Torres will back up Netburn not because of their relationship, but because Judge Netburn is correct. Okay, moving on and pulling back, let's talk about something not well-reasoned or supported. This week in crypto was very interesting as the turf war in the United States over regulation of the crypto market reached fever pitch as JP Morgan, I mean the SEC, squared off against the CFTC, the Commodities Commission, over control of the crypto market and the first salvo was shot by the SEC as it sued a manager at Coinbase for alleged insider trading related to digital tokens. Now, what's that have to do with crypto regulation? Well, the SEC only has jurisdiction over securities, so in order to file the lawsuit against the Coinbase manager, it had to allege that the assets were being sold as securities. So listen to the opening sentence of the lawsuit. Quote, this case involves insider trading in certain crypto asset securities that Coinbase Global Inc. Coinbase announced would be listed or made available to trade on its crypto asset trading platform, close quote. So the SEC in this lawsuit has defined digital assets as, quote, crypto asset securities. And by calling the nine or so digital assets in the lawsuit a security, the SEC is also basically alleging that Coinbase was and has been selling securities illegally. In fact, looking at some of these tokens specifically, you could say that this is the first official move by the SEC in which it really says all digital assets are securities, all of them. And just like that, the SEC both fired the first shot against the crypto exchanges and staked a large territory against the CFTC, the Commodities Commission. It's really a bit of an evil genius move by the SEC, to be honest. It's similar to like Japan's move into the Pacific and the Southeast Asia at the beginning of World War II, and a move by the SEC that I unfortunately foreshadowed back in January of 2021. And as a brief aside, while everyone is focused on the Ripple lawsuit, let me throw out a little hypothetical question to you. If you wanted to control an industry that involves over a thousand different companies, many of which are decentralized and difficult to control by nature, which is the more efficient way to control it? Suing each individual company one by one or by controlling the handful of large markets where those companies' goods are traded? The exchanges. Maybe I should have kept my mouth shut. And remind me to never wear that jacket again. In any case, the land grab by the SEC was responded to quickly by the CFTC. Here is the statement by CFT Commissioner Carolyn Pham. Quote, the case SEC versus Wahi, the lawsuit against the Coinbase manager, is a striking example of regulation by enforcement. The SEC complaint alleges that dozens of digital assets, including those that could be described as utility tokens and or tokens related to DAOs, are securities. The SEC's allegation could have broad implications. Major questions are best addressed through a transparent process that engages the public." Close quote. Wow, now it is rare that these types of battles are fought in the public eye, and to her credit, Commissioner Pham calls out the SEC for the power grab in a very powerful and strong way. I'm a little proud of her as she is Vietnamese, and I am honorary Vietnamese through marriage. Hi, guac go. And so now, the SEC versus Commodities Commission turf battle is out in the open, but another consequence of the SEC lawsuit this week is that it made a lot of companies and organizations that have been sitting silent since the Ripple lawsuit sit up and finally take notice and speak out. Coinbase responded almost instantly in the form of a defiant post by its chief legal officer titled, 
Coinbase does not list securities. End of story. That's actually in, in the title of the story. The Coinbase chief legal officer is Paul Graywall, and as he states in his article, quote, the U.S. doesn't have a clear or workable regulatory framework for digital asset securities. And instead of crafting tailored rules in a transparent way, the SEC is relying on these types of one-off enforcement actions to try and bring all digital assets into its jurisdiction, even those assets that are not securities, close quote. And I read this and I thought to myself, what took you so long to figure this out? I personally hope the SEC does sue Coinbase because the SEC Director of Enforcement Gerber Graywall would then be pitted against Coinbase's legal officer Paul Graywall and it would be Graywall versus Graywall in court. And speaking of SEC Director Graywall, he was recently pulled in front of Congress to answer softball questions lobbed at him by SEC Representative Brad Sherman. Oh, I'm sorry, he's California Congressman Brad Sherman. My bad. And here he is. The courts have acted with the Howey test which was uh, not focused on digital assets since it was written in the 1940s. But the fact remains XRP, I think, clearly is a security. And uh, we need enforcement not only on those who issued the unregistered security, but those who provided in exchange for it. Say what? How does he conclude that XRP is a security when no one other than SEC and Ripple legal staff have seen the evidence in the actual case. Very curious. And how does he know how to mention that enforcement is needed against the exchanges? Who wrote those notes for him that he's looking at? Actually, Cameron, if we could just like zoom in on his notes for a second. Tim, do you think you could just kind of zoom in on his notes? Ah, oh, okay. Well, at least it makes sense now. But don't worry, crypto supporters. Thankfully, some other Congress people were present, and one of those congressmen was Congressman Emmer. Assets, the SEC is hell bent on expanding the size of its crypto enforcement division and using enforcement to unconstitutionally expand its jurisdiction. Under Chair Gensler, the SEC has become a power hungry regulator, politicizing enforcement, baiting companies to, quote, come in and talk to the commission, then hitting them with enforcement actions and discouraging good faith cooperation. Understand, sir, there is a new day coming. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Emmer. Okay, I liked it, liked the passion. I wish you had talked more about exactly how a new day is coming, but time will tell. But for now, we are zooming back in and moving back to SEC litigation because there are two other key things going on in the crypto litigation world that you need to know about. First, this week, the SEC versus Library case had its summary judgment hearing. The Library LBC token is a utility token used to access video files, kind of like YouTube, but you pay for and are paid with the Library token, is my understanding, when you access the videos. It's a very interesting use case for blockchain, and the founding company was sued by the SEC after Ripple was sued. Oral argument was held in, front, in the Library case in front of the judge this week, and Jeremy Kaufman, who is the owner of the company, was present and Digital Cash Network was there as well, and Digital Cash put together a great summation video of the hearing. Listen to this, it's actually quite shocking. I was just at a US District Court hearing on the case of Library versus the SEC, and this case is basically meant to determine whether or not LBC, the library token, is a security. Library argued that it is not because it serves a very crucial purpose on the blockchain, on actually publishing content, on paying creators, etc., and that the company behind the protocol heavily focused on its utilitarian purposes. Whereas the SEC maintains that because some people have used it as an investment, it therefore is a security, regardless of if it has a real utilitarian purpose or even how many people or what percentage of people use it for this purpose. This case could set an insane precedent that would basically make every single cryptocurrency out there a security. Even Bitcoin, you sell it to someone and some core developer somewhere else ends up building and improving on it becomes more valuable in the future, that would be a security. A lot hinges on this decision. Let's hope it goes the right way. Yes, you heard that correctly. Apparently the SEC at the hearing argued that as long as one person buys a token as an investment, hoping it goes up in price, then that token is a security, period. And Digital Cash is correct that this SEC definition would most definitely include Bitcoin in its umbrella. Now keep an eye on this case as the judge was wary of the SEC argument apparently, and the library case will be decided before the Ripple case, and I'm certain that the judgment will be filed in the Ripple case as persuasive authority either way, either by the Ripple or by SEC. And by the way, who also took a trip up to the courthouse to attend the library hearing? The one and only attorney, John Deaton. 
And speaking of Attorney Deaton, he is the subject of our last motion we're going to discuss in the Ripple case, and that is in relation to the motions to strike experts, expert reports, which are called Dalbert motions. We haven't seen the actual motions, but here's what is going on in short. So as we talked about before, the Ripple case will be decided at summary judgment. There probably won't be a jury trial. The judge will decide the case based on the evidence presented to her on paper, and a large part of that evidence will be expert opinions. Experts are people hired by the parties who have an expertise, such as in blockchain technology or something like that. And at this point, we are getting an idea that Ripple has retained over 10 experts, and the SEC may be a little bit less than half as that many. But the idea behind Daubert motions is generally twofold. First, the expert does have to rely on a method of arriving at his or her opinion that is somewhat objective and is accepted in the scientific community. And second, the expert should not be duplicative of, the, of another expert. Now this will be an important battle for Ripple as it has so many experts, there is bound to be some overlap in what they're saying. The idea is that you can't just go out and hire 10 experts to all say the same thing and just try to win by simple weight of numbers. So those challenges will be the focus of the case in the next month. And Deaton has moved to file a brief in regards to one of the SEC's experts who provided an opinion as to what XRP purchasers were actually thinking when they purchased XRP. The problem, as we now know it, is that the SEC expert on the topic of what XRP purchasers were thinking when they bought XRP not only never spoke with any actual purchasers, but never even tried. Let's take a look at the expert's deposition testimony. Question by the attorney. Did you try to find any XRP purchasers to ask them? Answer. I did not interview specific XRP purchasers or attempt to validate whether anybody did, you know, make a specific purchase and what their knowledge of Ripple was at that moment that they made the purchase. Close quote. So what do you think when you hear that? Now, I think that the testimony is not good for the SEC, especially so because Attorney Deaton represents over 68,000 actual purchasers of XRP, and Deaton recently filed a motion to file a brief in regard to this expert's opinion and bring actual buyer's perspective to the case rather than the expert's hypothetical buyers. And now we know that the SEC recognizes this big problem because once again, they have done something very strange and unusual, and out of the blue, they filed a motion demanding, again, that Deaton and XRP holders be excluded, not only from filing a brief in the Daubert challenge, but also be excluded from the case entirely. And here it is. Looking at the very first paragraph, quote, Plaintiff Securities and Exchange Commission respectfully opposes six XRP investors' motion to file an amicus brief regarding the opinions of the SEC's experts. Then there's some redacted stuff in there. And then finally, the court should deny the motion and prohibit Deaton from any further participation in these proceedings, close quote. And make no doubt about it, this motion is just a hit piece and it's obvious right away because attorneys are not in a case. They are only representing parties in a case. And that is why you don't refer to an attorney by their name in a pleading. You don't say attorney Stewart says this or that. You say the SEC says this or that. It's professional. And you never, an attack, you never attack an attorney personally for his representation of a client. And what the SEC does in this brief is it throws professionalism out the window and the SEC drafts a straight up hit piece of personal attacks on attorney Deaton. The attacks constitute carefully selected tweets and videos of attorney Deaton that he's made over the last two years. And I know that John tweets multiple times a day has appeared in numerous videos. I see him on Fox News all the time. So the saddest and most disappointing thing about this motion is that someone at the SEC spent a lot of time and taxpayer money going through hundreds of Twitter threads and hours of video in order to pull out these sad little gems. Looking at page two of the brief quote, March 2021, Deaton tweet, there's only one way to deal with a bully, punch that MF in the face. I'm up at 3 a.m. for a reason, profanity. See you soon, SEC News. March 9, 2021, Deaton tweet, SEC is a blood-sucking, innovation-killing cesspool of corruption. Now, I don't know firsthand experience if the SEC is a cesspool of corruption, but I do know that this brief is unprofessional and off-target. But I guess if you can't logically fight the message, you attack the messenger. Up to this point, in about a year and a half, the SEC has made some questionable legal decisions and arguments, but it has remained professional and cordial. And I was surprised and disappointed to see this motion and the personal attacks contained in it. 
which doesn't mean that Deaton will be allowed to file a brief on the Daubert issue. This is kind of a separate thing. I'll reserve judgment on that until I see Deaton res Deaton's response to this brief. But the main takeaway for myself was just disappointment and annoyance. I thought the attorneys representing my and our U.S. citizens' public interest might be misguided in this litigation, but I did not expect them to stoop down to this level of petty, unprofessional litigation. It's shameful and it's sad. But anyway, thanks for watching and thank you, Mom, for spending your Saturday morning here doing silly things with me. Love you, Mom. Bye.